look, before I get going here today, I, I do want to throw a uh, throw a shout out to, uh, to Endace. Um, you know, I, I do a lot of these webcasts. I've done a lot of these with a lot of different partners and, and uh, vendor partners. Um, and uh, anybody else, by the way, that's a vendor partner or has been watching this, you know, don't be like, why didn't Jake mention us? But um, I'll say here that, uh, you know, Endace uh, throughout this whole process, you know, as we got into talking about like, hey, you know, what are we going to do for a webinar series and, and whatnot? First off, most often it's like a webinar, not a webinar series, right? But even when it is, um, you know, there's usually a lot of product integration and marketing and whatever. And they're just like, look, we definitely want to cover, you know, some some packet capture related stuff. That's what we do, right? Um, and in fact, I just wrote a white paper form. I think that's coming out. Uh, I actually don't know when that's coming out, um, but uh, I'm sure it is. Um, and, uh, you know, around packet capture and whatnot. But but I, I, I want to really like throw these guys just a, I guess guys and gals um, over there as well. Uh, but I, I want to throw them mad props because it is really rare for a vendor to come in, rare. It's unheard of. I've never had this experience before. A vendor's like, look, Here's what we want to do. We want to come in and start talking protocol analysis. And I'm like, okay, yeah. So protocol analysis and how your device does it. They're like, yeah, I mean, mention the device, right? But like come in and do protocol analysis. And we've already had a chance to do this, right? We did HTTP and HTTPS. Well, really mostly HTTP. And um, we did that, um, you know, a couple of, uh, I guess about a month ago now almost. Um, and uh, this is, well, episode two. Uh, we're we're going to take a look at SMB and, and SIFS. Um, and so I, just again, as, as we get going, um, and, and if you attended the last one of these, um, you know that it's a lot of me and Wireshark. Um, now I do wanna throw out here that I created the last set of packet captures um, and released those publicly um, on my GitHub, um, but uh, I, I don't own these. These were generated by Endace. I think there's an intent to publish these. Um, I, I just, before anybody asked the obvious question of, can I have the PCAP? Because it would be the first question I'd ask too. Um, it's, yeah, I don't know. I think the answer is yes, but I, but I won't swear to it. That said, again, I just, um, yes. Oh, what are the odds? I've got Endace actually in the questions right now. They're like, oh, you can just publish these. So I'll put these up on the GitHub um, as soon as my, uh, basically as soon as this is over, I'll upload these to, uh, upload these to GitHub, and my, my, my GitHub there. And if you follow me on Twitter, Malware Jake, um, I'll, I'll post the link out there so that you can come grab them, right? So well, there we go. This is awesome. Thank you so much, Mark. I appreciate that. That said, let's get rocking. Again, I just wanted to like really, put, you know, really throw out there what a treat it is to work with these guys. Now, I do also want to mention they have a fantastic product and we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, packet capture is obviously important. And I, I, I want to take a look today at a couple of packet capture items here and, and note that today's intrusions are increasingly complex in nature. And analysts are being asked repeatedly to discuss what data was viewed by the threat actor. Now, if you do a lot of forensics, um, you know that one of the big tools that you're gonna use for this on endpoint is something called shell bags. Anybody deal with shell bags at all? Oh, here I'm like waiting for an answer, right? Maybe I see it in questions, maybe not, whatever. If you haven't dealt with shell bags, this is one of the big things that we look at. Um, if you've ever noticed how Windows like holds on to your layout of you know, a particular folder that you were in, that's actually done in a registry hive called userclass.dat, usrclass.dat. And so um, there are times that you can use that, and we, we frequently do, uh, to actually go through and do some analysis and say, oh, okay, I see that threat actor or somebody using this account, right, saw these files. We might not have all the exfil, right? Well, oftentimes we don't have all the exfil, right? Or it's encrypted or dot, dot, dot. And so one of the things that's used there is, is that to say, well, they at least knew of the existence of those files. That's not the same thing as opened those files, right? It's not the same thing as copied those files. And so I wanna show you today, particularly with SMB, how we're able to use packet capture to go in and say, if we have east-west, by the way, right? So if you're not familiar with the terms east-west and north-south, north-south is, is generally ingress, egress, and east-west um, is the internal traffic. Now, some old school people, Right, that you talk to, and I mean old school gray beards, like they know what risk architecture is, like they actually know, they didn't learn about it in uh, you know, like an A plus course or something. Um, those folks sometimes will refer to East West as the client network into the data center, right? So that being like the only tap point. But we we traditionally, when we talk about East West traffic, we, we mean a you know, generically internal traffic, right? Um, so if I have good East West traffic, 
right? I, I can start to pull some of this apart and say, okay, let's take a look at what did they see, what file contents did they see, threat accuracy, versus the, the actual file itself. Now, I have worked multiple intrusions now where literally shell bags has been what legal counsels looked at and said, we know the threat actor saw that file. It would be ridiculous if they didn't exfiltrate it. Therefore, you're notifying everybody whose data is in that Excel you know, spreadsheet, right? Um, and uh, as as one of the uh, vets who got uh, you know got impacted by, you may remember a few years ago, uh, there was a VA uh, Veterans Administration analyst who left a laptop in the trunk. Um, the uh, trunk got popped, and they ran away with the laptop, right? Um, and uh, sure enough, there was a big Excel spreadsheet on there with tens of thousands of veterans. Of course, just of course, right? Because OPM wasn't cool enough. Um, I had to get my data breached yet again. Uh, and uh, just just fun, right? Um, but that that's exactly what happens here, right? We had no other evidence the threat actor saw, opened anything that file. And I even at the time, I'm like, man, if we only had east-west packet capture, we'd be able to say yay or nay. And, and, and if you've never worked one of these, let me tell you that um, notifying, uh, you know, whatever we're talking about, or tens of thousands of people, hundreds of thousands of people is not a position that you want to be in. I mean, I guess that goes without saying, but even the mechanics of it are reasonably difficult. Um, you know, again, if you want to wear, I mean, forgive the hero stuff in the background here, I'm a Marvel fan, uh, but if you want to be like an actual no joke, legit superhero, don't buy a bunch of cosplay stuff, right? Um, you know, do, do something like this where you are the person like, but for this, right? But for, um, you know, somebody coming in and saying, we got you, right? Um, you know, we got your back because we deployed packet capture at a time. Um, it's a, uh, yes, right? Um, so look, uh, regardless, and I want to highlight this again here. We talked about this in the first webcast that we did, but I want to highlight this point again because the threat actors are indeed taking, uh, you know, counter forensic or anti forensic actions on the endpoint. I spoke about this at Black Hat actually in uh, 2019, um, right before uh, 2019, 2020, something like that. 20, yeah, 20, late 2019, uh, Black Hat Europe talking about uh, basically false flags, right? Planting evidence, let alone destruction of evidence been talked about for decades, right? Um, and so the, the reality is good threat actors are doing this, right? They are absolutely taking anti-forensic measures. PCAP absolutely doesn't lie. It's ground truth. That's where it is. By the way, have you ever been to a conference, security conference, where it's like, you see the t-shirt and it says PCAP or it didn't happen, right? I've never seen the corresponding shirt where it's like endpoint or it didn't happen, right? Why is that? It's obvious, right? It's because, well, at the end of the day, the threat actor is in band on the endpoint. But when we go to packet capture, they're out of band. Okay, so look, I've got another highlight here from the, uh, from the original deck that I do wanna bring back up as we talk about uh, packet capture here. Um, and, you know, I, I want to mention here, and this is as I'm going to tie into what the Endace product or, or the probe, as they call it, does. Um, but uh, ultimately here, they are capturing all, just, I mean, they're capturing any traffic that, that you can throw at the probe. And, and, and as I mentioned before, I just did a white paper on, you know, some of the utilizations around devices such as theirs, right? Um, but, but you get the idea, right? I mean, when it comes down to it, they have the ability to bring in lots of packet capture. And then we have the ability to analyze that across multiple different tools. It's one of the things that I really like about the platform that sets it apart um, is that I have the ability to take that packet capture and replay it to practically any tool. And that's fantastic for me. And, and, and I don't want to spend too much time deep diving on the replay side, um, but it is important to know that I have some tools out there that uh, unfortunately can't handle some high speed networking and and the beauty of this is I can actually spin that down. I can spin the tool down and say, uh, basically the packet capture replay and say, oh, you can only handle gigabit? No problem. Here, we'll, we'll replay what we originally captured on a 10 gig network. We'll replay that on a one gig network, right? Or captured on gig, we'll replay it on, I don't think we have too many 100 meg um, tools left out there, but you get the idea. This is another way to, you know, hopefully you get the idea. It's another way that we can, you know, really bring that, uh, bring that in. Now, I, I do want to mention here that one of the biggest problems with packet capture analysis in the first place is not the storage, right? And, and anybody who's built a packet capture system, uh, and what I like to call a dumb packet capture, please don't think I'm calling you dumb. Um, but when I talk about a dumb packet capture system, what I mean is it literally reads bytes off the wire and writes packets into a, a basic onto a drive, right? Well, that's great. And so I, I'm basically limited by 
uh, as far as for storage, retention, whatever, um, you know, basically speed over, uh, you know, time, speed obviously turns into, and, and data pass turns into file size. And, and then of course the free space on my drive is, is a reflection of that, right? Or it's a reflection, it's a, it's a limiting factor there. And lots of, lots of folks are like, hey, drives are, drives are cheap, terabytes it is, right? And it's like, okay, cool. But can you ever operationalize that packet capture? Can you ever find the packet capture that you're interested in again, right? Or, or period at all. And so this is one of the worst case scenarios. And, and unfortunately, during incident response, um, I, I bump into this quite a bit, right? Where you know some uh, small medium enterprise um, with you know a security team of one has taken time uh, to actually deploy, and it's heartbreaking. They've taken time to actually go deploy one of these systems, right? Um, and they took the time to deploy the system, and now what, right? Now we can't actually action the packet capture, right? Why can't we action the packet capture? Because we can't find the stuff that we actually need, right? Okay, so, so often though, right, we hear about the whole like, hey, we've got to go operationalize uh, these indicators of compromise. And, and okay, that's fine. I mean, but, but how do I operationalize those? A lot of it depends on my system, right? So if I have something like a Zeek, that's outstanding. Um, I, I like obviously the ability to, to use, if you haven't used Zeek, by the way, it's fantastic. Um, and uh, I believe, oh, actually, I don't think I can talk about that. Never mind. Um, so anyway, uh, so Zeek is a fantastic tool. Um, I love Zeek and, and, and I can take packets that I've captured here and then I can go replay those across Zeek. But I don't have to go, and by the way, too, I can replay days of packet capture in, in, in hours, right? Because not only can I slow down, I can also speed it up, right? So again, as we start talking about like different capabilities and stuff to kind of think about a little bit here, I mean, again, I highly encourage you, of course, I'll tweet out when the white paper gets released, but, um, you know, follow that and take a look at the white paper because it is, I, I, I think, reasonably uh, sets, sets out a good set of use cases, right? And, and, and all things that I've experienced firsthand, right? Um, so. What I typically do, though, is I'm looking for indexed fields, right? So if you have a packet capture solution today, one of the things you need to determine is what fields specifically are being indexed? What can you search against, right? Um, and what are you just like brute force searching through the entire corpus of, of data, right? Because the indexes obviously get us to data quickly. And so this is where I typically will try to filter first on indexes or indexed fields and then time ranges. And then if I need more granular analysis, that's where I'm typically exporting or taking that slice of data and playing that back to another system that I can get more granular with, right? Um, so that, that's really where, you know, I start talking about how to operationalize and, and whatnot. One of the questions that I had in one of the first, um, uh, <clears throat> one of the first, uh, first things that I, uh, uh, first things, one of the first uh, questions that I got um, you know, as I started, that I had actually too, as I got into the probe is what can I filter against, right? And it's like, well, okay, what's indexed, right? Um, and uh, Mark is telling me here that indeed, um, I am allowed to say that Zeek is now pre-installed um, on basically there's a, 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 the ability to run a virtual machine. In fact, I'll, I'll pull up the, uh, um, the Endace probe here because um, I'm in my office, right? Which is pretty cool. Uh, let's see, uh, here we go. Let's go ahead and pull this guy up here. Now, if you're thinking, why is it not secure? Uh, the answer is because, let's see, it's, oh, no, nope, that's wrong. I wanted it to be the admin one. I feel like that's gonna need to be, survey says, okay, there we go. Um, by the way, too, if you're like not secure, it's because I, I don't have a host name for it. I've got it on a 10 dot address. Um, but, but I do wanna show very quickly here, like some of the stuff that you can do with this. And, and in fact, uh, let's see. Do I have the rotation file? Yeah, there we go. Um, so, and, and I've got a filter already up here. Uh, I've got port is 443. Let's see if I can make that bigger. There we go. Um, so I've got a port is 443, um, and I've got it filtered around some of this uh, some of this data. You can see it brought up conversations here. And in fact, from here, I can now say, and I understand it's bottom right here, but I have the options to download. Um, I can archive that off because I know it's of interest. Download means I'm actually getting the packet capture. And then I can also launch Wireshark, right? And this actually sits inside of one of these, um, what they call doc OSs. Um, and uh, basically this doc OS, effectively what I'm doing now, instead of downloading this and trying to figure out, is this interesting, is it not, whatever, this basically is gonna just fire up Wireshark right here. Now, I'm gonna walk you through exporting some objects today. Um, sometimes those are malicious. We don't have any malicious objects in this specific packet, or these specific packet captures, but 
but they do exist, right? Um, obviously, if we're doing lateral movement investigations, et cetera, which we'll walk through here in a minute. Um, but uh, I, I do want that obviously to be a, you know, uh, I do want to be safe here, right? Well, the good news here is that Wireshark, um, you know, is, is running in a container effectively. Um, and uh, just, I mean, also I don't have to download and then, you know, load the packets. I don't have that much selected up here, uh, but notice that there are basically previous 100 meg and next 100 meg. Um, if you ever tried to filter on like ginormous packet captures in Wireshark, I, it's it's not something you want to do. First off, it's it's more likely to crash Wireshark than anything else. But second, it, it, it it's just not effective. The second you filter, you're just waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting. Right? Go grab a coffee, call your mom. She loves you. All that stuff, right? Because you're not getting the you know you're not getting all the response back immediately. So all that said. Um, I probably, well, not, I'm probably not going to, I'm not going to use this specific, by the way, in case you're like looking, I'm like, is this real? It totally is. I can interact with this. It's, it is Wireshark. Um, because I'm going to export a bunch of objects and I want to be able to show you that in the analysis, I will be using my own Wireshark uh, locally here because I've, I've already gone through those pre-processes of, of down selecting that traffic because I want to deep dive into SMB, right? Um, but uh, I did want to show you this here. And then I also want to call out uh, because Mark said it's okay. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, because Mark said it's okay, is that uh, Zeek is already pre-installed um, in, in Endace, right? So in Endace Probe. Now, I haven't updated my version of the probe yet um, to have a, and I actually have a physical probe in my office here. I haven't updated my version of that to have the uh, have Zeek built in, but I was mentioning that earlier around like stuff, I can take that and replay it to Zeek. The, the fact that I don't have to leave the probe at all, I don't have to set up a, you know, a, a, any kind of crazy, it just, I, I just, I just go and say, okay, oh, yeah, now fire this packet capture past uh, past Zeke. By the way, if you're now stepping back thinking, well, if you were going to do that, why didn't you have Zeke on all the time? My friends, um, you go run Zeke in an internal network. I don't mean like the egress stuff. I mean like east-west. Um, you have all kinds of privacy, potential privacy issues there, et cetera. Look, I'm not your legal compliance person, uh, particularly if you're in the EU or, or goodness for sake, man, Germany. Um, I'm, I'm definitely not your legal compliance anybody, right? But um, this is a spot where I can tell you that there are organizations that won't do that type of metadata collection. They'll have to do the data collection, right? And they're just like, but but we justify every search and every analysis and every, right? And so the idea there being like, you know, we definitely, you're only seeing something if there was a reason to investigate it in the first place, right? Might might be a way to look at that. Um, and and also there's Suricata and uh, Snort and you know, all spun up in that in the doc OS. And again, that all runs directly on the probe. So I, I did want to call that out. Um, and uh, in fact, I've got a couple of uh, screenshots here because, you know, these live better in the slides than they do uh, they do elsewhere. I mentioned the integrated Wireshark. And, and now, look, I probably should get into actual SMB analysis. The rest of these slides, honestly, are here for me to, you know, if I have some ridiculous technical failure, um, I can go back, I guess, to slides for the Let's not do that. Um, instead, um, let, let's instead go and uh, and open some uh, open some packet capture up. So I think the first one that I want to do here is let's do a file copy. All right. So I'm going to fire up my Wireshark here, and I'm going to presume that everybody can see the Wireshark. And if they can't for whatever reason due to technology failure, Carol will jump in and tell me that. But Barring that, um, I think we're set here. Uh, look, the first thing I'm going to do on this um, when we're talking about a file copy, I'm going to start with a filter SMB or SMB2. All right. Now, the reason for this is that we typically have more than SMB or SMB or SMB2. That was cute. Um, okay. Um, so, <clears throat> so the reason that uh, basically I filter against those um, is that you know, or against both. Um, is that SMB2 has kind of become, or not kind of, has become the de facto, uh, you know, protocol for, or version of the protocol. Now, there's an SMB version 3, and I know somebody's going to ask me, Jake, why are we going to SMB version 3? And the answer is it's encrypted, right? Um, it's encrypted. And that's, I mean, now, I, I do want to mention, by the way, that if you are capturing session keys, right, um, just like for HTTPS, right, if you're capturing session keys, you can indeed read um, the, uh, you can indeed read and decrypt SMB version three. Nobody's capturing this, right? So that means you got to capture those actually on the endpoints. Um, and I don't say nobody's capturing those. We back up and say that generally that's not the case, right? Um, the good news is we still have a little bit of time here because, uh, you know, realistically, 
um, unless you have SMB, unless you're SMB3 to SMB3, um, generally, and, and even then in legacy environments, a lot of SMB2 is still out there. Um, but I want to highlight that here so that you've got an idea of what you can see in most, honestly, in most environments, right? So uh, that, I, that I'm still looking at today, I'm still seeing a lot of SMB2. Um, so a couple of things to note here, right? Um, so first off, the protocol, uh, based on the protocol request, uh, request and response. Um, and so I want to jump in here to the protocol request. And I want you to note over here, we were talking about the, uh, the versioning, right? Um, and notice over here, it's saying, hey, look, um, I, I can speak, right? I can speak SMB2, right? Um, and, and it even says too, by the way, like if you really want to go crazy, all right? Like we, we, we can drop back a little bit. But um, so we see that with the request. We also see in the response, right? The server comes back, yeah, uh, server comes back and uh, ultimately um, <clears throat> it comes back and says, okay, cool. Uh, and by the way here it says signing is enabled, right? Um, what does SMB signing enabled mean? Well, first off, you should drop down here and take a look and, and note that enabled is actually not the uh, it's it's not the more secure version of the two. Typically, like I look and I'm like, oh, signing is enabled, and the opposite of signing is disabled. Nope, not here. Um, so in in this case, uh, with this, with the security mode uh, being set here, basically we have the option for it's either enabled or required, right? Um, so uh, now, I'm not saying here that you can't turn off SMB signing. I'm saying here in this particular bit field, um, those are our two are our two options. If you're not familiar with SMB signing, um, this is a, a fantastic, uh, you know, a fantastic thing that we look for in audits. It's fantastic security control that we look for in security audits. And the reason for this is it, it's it's man in the middle, right? Um, so basically, if I'm going to do uh, what's effectively an NTLM relay. Um, and uh, th this this effectively requires the threat actor con to control, um, you know, basically either uh, some routing. Oftentimes, we'll do this with link layer multicast name resolution uh, or ARP poisoning. Um, and uh, basically, we'll, we'll, we'll try to get you to route traffic to us, and then or or, or wait for a legitimate connection to us, um, and then try to relay that to another system. All right. Now, if SMB signing is enabled, um, you know, we, we can't do that. All right. And by, by the way, too, I should mention that. Uh, that the SMB relay does not require a specific ARP poisoning or link layer multicast name resolution, any of that. Um, it's often done, in, you know, an accompaniment with that. Uh, but uh, <clears throat> basically, with this NTLM relay, effectively, what's happening is that, that I'm I'm pivoting, or basically, when you connect to me, right? I, I say, okay, well, before I issue this challenge, right? Um, why don't I go and get a challenge from a different system, right? So I just make the same request to another server. Um, and request a challenge using the same account you're authenticating to me with, um, and then effectively I get you to solve the challenge for me, right? And then I just replay that over. Well, with SMB signing, that's impossible, right? If SMB signing is is required, right? Meaning it's established for that session, that that becomes impossible. Right? Um, so, what else do you want to take a look at here? Obviously, again, they they do their dance, um, and we ultimately uh, ultimately do the uh, basically do the dance of Hey, what protocols do you speak, right? Um, and here you see the server uh, coming through again, basically showing indeed that it, uh, excuse me, this is a client, uh, showing indeed that uh, it can speak SMB2 or SMB3. Um, and then, <clears throat> excuse me, let's see, where's my SMB2 header? Uh, okay, um, and so effectively here then the, uh, uh, the server then responds, uh, basically responds back um, and they've effectively set up the, uh, basically set up their session. Um, and, well, this is the client coming back to set up the session. And now, what's what's beautiful here is this tree request. And one of the uh, one of the filters that I show people regularly. I didn't start with this because I I wanted to actually walk through that piece. But it's SMB two dot tree, right? And SMB two dot tree shows you basically every time there's a directory request, right? So if you want to list directory, right? You want to see what's in a particular directory. This uh, this ultimately is 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 the request that gets called, and so this becomes a really great place for us to go through and be like, okay, what directory or files uh, were you know attempted to be accessed uh, or transferred for that matter by the uh, basically by I was going to say the threat actor, but in this case we're not necessarily threat actor specific, um, just between the server and the client what was what was transferred right, and so none of this looks suspicious to me, but. Again, you know, as opposed to me looking through, let me clear this filter so I see the how many packets. 
3,800, right? Um, and we're down to 96 displayed, right? Um, and uh, again, th this is fantastic for us. Um, now, if you're like, hey, wh why does this continue to, you know, wh why do you continue to see some of the same stuff again and again and again? Um, part of that is ultimately that we're creating the request um, and then creating the response and then closing the request. Right? And the, when the response closes, it doesn't actually show that, right? So if you're looking at this, like, why is the repetition there? It, that's ultimately where SMB is responding to the tree request, um, and it calls it a request file, right? So that's one of the interesting kind of SMB semantics um, is that, you know, basically it's most of the command responses, so like for a directory list, um, are, are sent back as if they're file data. That's why it calls it a request file. Um, so, and here then we can very quickly see that there's nothing here that looks uber suspicious. And that's good. And honestly, that's intended because, well, there's nothing suspicious going on. This is just a, uh, just a generic, uh, generic packet capture um, that has an actual file transfer. Um, we can see again the share that they logged into as well. And so that's the BPS VR01, um, as well as the server, obviously, and then the slash shared. Um, is the uh, slash shared effectively is, is the share itself. Now, if you've done any work with SMB, you're probably familiar with shares that end in dollar signs, right? Um, and in fact, I think we saw one of those earlier with IPC dollar sign. Let's see if we have that for us in there. Did I see IPC? I thought I did a second ago, but maybe another, pack. I'm positive it's another packet capture. Yeah. Then you can see here too, right? We, we can see additional, um, you know, request response files here, but basically, again, we're down to a, a you know, a relatively uh, small number of files, and we don't have to worry about, by the way, here too, um, I say don't have to worry about, we, we can see specifically, um, you know, what ultimately has been transferred uh, or what has been viewed. Now, I do want to show you here a feature of Wireshark with exporting objects, right? So I want to go export and uh, export objects SMB, and what I'm going to do here, note, th this is one of my cheat codes, right, that Remember before I was looking at the file list and I'm like, oh man, a lot of these are directory lists. Tons of these are directory lists, right? Because that's what I was looking for before is the trees, right? Um, so, but now it's a question of, okay, do I have, uh, basically, do I have what files ultimately were, you know, were passed across SMB? Now, this is obviously different than the, uh, you know, obviously different than all the requests that we saw before. Again, most of those were for, uh, were for directories. Um, and, and, and even then passing file names across potentially, but not the actual file content data itself. And just to lay out there what we're talking about, we're talking about the delta between, or the difference between um, ultimately, you know, mapping a drive and viewing, there are, let's say hundred files in that share versus downloading several of those files from the share, right? So, so markedly different things. These are the files that actually were downloaded. And Wireshark conveniently showed, and I say downloaded, could have been uploaded as well. I should be very, very clear about that as well. Um, but uh, <clears throat> I should mention here as well that, uh, that Wireshark also knows uh, how much of the content it actually picked up, right? And you can notice here that there's a couple of these we don't have the full content for. Um, that doesn't mean that it's not necessarily useful. It still may be useful, but a lot of these we have the full content for. And in fact, if you click on one of these objects, um, you can actually, it'll take you directly in Wireshark to uh, the spot where we have uh, both the read, the read response and, and you know, basically, the, sorry, the read request and then the read response, which is, again, transferring that uh, transferring that data. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and say save all because YOLO, right? Um, and uh, let's go ahead and create a new folder in here and we'll call this um, normal and we'll select that folder. Okay, and then I'm gonna drag this guy over here. On. Ooh, it just said audio connection restored. My apologies. How long has my sound gone for? I definitely wasn't muted. It just did something crazy with the sound. Very, very briefly, Jake. That is super weird. Like super weird. I, I've got it. I kid you not. I have a ping. I have a constant ping up and I never drop any packets on the ping. So that is super weird. Okay. Well, as you can see, um, this is a, uh, basically, as you can see, this, this is a legitimate file. Um, not only is it a legitimate file, I want to make super clear about something that we 
in forensics, right, we, we usually kind of take for granted, like sometimes there's munging of files where we dump something from memory. It's not the same hash, right? Give or take, there's some of the same content there. There's That's not the case here. This is a no joke known hash, right? So why? Well, we've got 100% of the file content in the original format that it sits on disk, right? It's fantastic. Now, by the way, with Zeek, um, which Mark mentioned to me and said, yes, go, right, earlier, at least I hope that's what was in the chat. Um, but uh, with Zeek, Zeek will do this for you as well um, and can do it a, a little more automatically. Um, but this is the more manual, uh, the more manual approach if you do find yourself having to go and export from or grab an, you know, grab an actual file um, from the uh, file of interest, obviously, right, uh, from your packet capture. All right. So again, not a whole lot interesting in this one, but but I did want to show it, uh, I did want to show it regardless. Um, okay, I say not a whole lot interesting. I mean, obviously we're ramping up here, right? So, okay, let's get, uh, let's get rid of this guy and we'll close this and we'll close this and then let's go grab another packet capture. I guess I could just let this on the screen. This is the fun of live demos, right? Um, so, okay, um, let's go with, Ah, oh, oh, we should talk about the printer connection as well. Okay, so if you're not familiar with, with RPC, um, notice over here you see the DCE RPC, right? You notice over here that it's port, uh, basically port 135, right? So we have from a random high to port 135. Now, my goal today is not to deep dive into RPC, um, but we do actually have to talk just a wee bit about RPC. Um, RPC has the port mapper on Windows, at least on port 135, and it's used to access a lot of services because with a remote procedure call service, if you've ever run a netstat on your machine before, you probably have noticed that there are some random high ports, right? You can watch this like do, this is this is like danger, 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 live demoing, right? Um, but you'll notice that there are probably some random high ports that are listening, right? Um, these guys over here, right? These are all random highs. Um, now, if you're on an older, like, legacy machine, like Server 2003, and you should not be, it would be like ports 1025 to 1026. I can't remember which one it starts at. 1025, I think, um, up to 4999, right? Um, in later versions of Windows, typically you're in the 45,000s, I think, for I think for Windows 7, and I think Windows 8 and Windows 10 start at the 49-something range. Um, now, the problem with this is these are listening. They're obviously listening on the network. But every time the machine starts, every time I add another service, like these aren't well-known ports. You go Google 49668, right? You're not going to run into anything. But what you will notice over here is that on a well-known port, right, I've got port 135, right? So TCP port 135. Uh, okay, well, now the plot thickens, right? Um, so port 135 is the port mapper, right? And the port mapper, right, effectively, when you connect to the port mapper, the port mapper says, oh, what service were you looking for? oh, that happens to be sitting over here on port 499 whatever, right? And so that's ultimately how the client machine then gets to know, you know, basically what did the server machine, I mean, it's another workstation, it's still a server, right? Uh, in, in the TCP IP context. And so here, basically, this is the, the Rosetta Stone, as it were, for decoding what's listening where right now. Okay, so got that. Um, and again, that's that's your endpoint, the endpoint mapper. Um, you can see this map request. In fact, if you want to dive into this at all, uh, let's see. Uh, we're looking for, oh, uh, looking effectively for the. I never remember where this guy sits. It's not over here. Uh, there we go. RPC net logon. Now, this is a kind of interesting piece here too. I'll have folks go through and and they'll go search for um, RPC net logon. Uh, don't do that. The actual text RPC net logon. Uh, Wireshark is decoding this for you, right? In fact, if you look. Right. If you look at the uh, the bytes that are highlighted there down at the bottom, like the text RPC net logon does not appear anywhere there. This is something that Wireshark again is is, is decoding uh, decoding for you. Um, so that's ultimately calling the net logon service. And then you'll notice here almost immediately afterwards, you see on port. As a matter of fact, we can see it here. Uh, bum, 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 port four nine one five five. All right. Um, so let's go here then and TCP port. Uh, 49155, right? And now you see indeed that there's a connection being made to 49155. 
Again, how do they know? The answer is the port mapper. The port mapper does that for them. And again, the port mapper on Windows, it's on port 135, TCP, TCP port 135. Okay, so enough about that. Let's get into the SMB stuff, right? But I saw that and I'm like, oh, we have to cover this because at the end of the day, when you connect to a printer, you actually are doing a remote procedure call. In fact, if you remember Print Nightmare, actually, who can forget Print Nightmare? Um, with Print Nightmare, uh, you may remember Microsoft, uh, I'm not going to talk bad about Microsoft at all here, you know, with, with their handling of that, but you probably remember um, there were multiple attempts to patch Print Nightmare, right? Um, and, uh, you know, multiple different attack vectors. And, and part of the reason for that ultimately ended up being that, um, you know, Print Nightmare is very deep in RPC code, right? The print spooler still involves a lot of the remote procedure call stuff from whew, eons ago. Um, honestly, probably needs to be rewritten. Uh, that's, but that's that's opinion stuff. Whatever. Bottom line, um, th th it's a very complex subsystem, and and, and printing uses it, right? Um, so, I do want to mention here. We we already saw the SMB or SMB2 uh, filter that I'd used uh, that I'd used earlier, um, but I do want to show you a different. Uh, and this is again for a printer connection. Uh, oh, I mentioned before too the uh, IPC. I said I thought we'd see IPC dollar sign. Um, I, I mentioned before that there are some dollar sign shares, right? they all end in dollar sign. When you see a dollar sign share, um, that means that it's a hidden share. Any share that you name with a dollar sign uh, ending, right? Windows won't show you a neighborhood network, right? Um, and so the, the idea behind this was that you just wouldn't show, uh, basically people couldn't browse to all these different shares. And then there are default administrative shares, right? So every every drive letter has a, a drive letter dollar sign. It's only accessible by admin by default. IPC dollar sign is what's used for inter-process communication um, and definitely across the uh, across the network uh, to communicate. If you've ever used PS exact, PS exact actually uses an IPC dollar sign to copy a bunch of data. Uh, well, the, the service, right? Um, so again, saw that and I figured I'd bring that one up. Um, but I do want to introduce you to a different. Uh, <coughs> I do want to introduce you to a different filter here, Spool SS, right? Um, so this is the Spooler, I, Spooler system something subservice, I think. I, I got to work that one out here. Um, so what you're looking for here typically is you map a printer, right, or using a printer, um, are these calls to open printer or open printer X. Um, by the way, if you're like, oh, why is it open printer? You know, what's the EX or whatever? Uh, Microsoft many eons ago um, didn't really, I say didn't really, but uh, may not have cared as much about security and and what are the odds? And and, and alas, um, you know, over time, um, they've had to go and, and, and really uh, upgrade some of their APIs. And when you see the EXs, those are upgraded APIs, right? Um, if you saw an open printer, it's probably coming from a legacy client, right? Or or a not native Windows client, right? So I see some open printers here and there as I use instead of open printer EX. EX means extended, right? And basically means that the API takes more more arguments, and usually those are security-related arguments, right? If it makes, if it helps or makes sense or whatever, call it security enhanced, that whatever, right? For the EX. Um, so I'm looking at an open printer X, um, and let's see. Uh, oh, that's a closed printer. I was like, how am I? Oh, because it's a closed printer request. Of course it is, right? Let's go find an actual open printer request, right? So open printer X request. There we go. I was like, man, that's really surprising. I'm not seeing that there. Let's take a look at what printer are we talking about here, right? Well, there we go, right? Um, now, if you're thinking, okay, right, cool, let me go find whatever, right, this, uh, this string, um, you can, uh, but it obviously we're looking at Unicode here, right? So just bear that in mind, right, that every other byte is a null byte. And then of course that gets trailed with a double null, right? Um, so if you're doing just like raw grep or raw, like if you're doing like an end grep or something through packet capture, and you're like, where is the string? I know they mapped a Canon printer. Well, it's Unicode, right? Because everything in Windows is Unicode. Um, but, but now I can tell what did we map, right? So specifically, what did we map, right? Um, and so I can look at effectively us mapping a printer. I don't think we printed anything on this. I'm looking at like size of bytes here, and I don't think we printed. I think we just mapped. Yeah. Okay, so I think that's about where I want to leave that one. I'm going to scroll forward here to, to cooler stuff. Um, so let's close that one. And then, let's see, let me grab this file copy for the win. And like I said before, uh, thanks to Mark and the folks over at Endace who created these packet captures. Mark did indeed say that I can uh, that I can release these and tweet those, as it turns out, right? 
Um, and if somebody wants to be my superhero, you can go Google my, it's Malware Jake LLC on the GitHub so that I can just post the, uh, you know, just drop it in the, uh, uh, drop it in the questions box. I'll copy it over into the, uh, you know, into the chat so that everybody's got it now instead of trying to dig it up on Twitter later. Um, so, or I'll do it at the very end of the webcast so everybody's got it. But anyway, um, okay, so I'm going to start here again with my SMB, oh, SMB or SMB2. Right? Okay, so now I've got, uh, you know, again, basically here I'm looking to see, do we see anything interesting? Well, a couple of things, right? As an investigator, right, and I'm, I'm putting my investigator hat on, right? I could be troubleshooting a problem here. More often than not, I'm investigating some interesting connection. And my friends, um, if if these are truly uh, you know workstations, and of course we don't have the context here, you would in your investigation, I hope, have the context of what these IP addresses are. I, I don't know, BP SVR does sound like a server, um, but uh, again, I, I can see effectively um, you know what was uh, well what we mapped up, and this this is a basically a shared drive. Um, or it says share, right? But it's a regular share as opposed to a default administrative share, which again, sets off alarm bells. And we're gonna see one of those in just a second with a piece of lateral movement, right? Um, and so likewise here, I can come take a hard look at, hey, what, what, what did we look at, right? What, what, all was, uh, what all was looked at here? I see, uh, yeah, let's see. Um, boom, boom. Yeah. And so we could scroll through this a little bit further. I'm not gonna do all that. I'm gonna go and I'm gonna use my Konami cheat code, right? And I'm gonna go over to export objects. And, and I, I do wanna mention here that I use this regularly even when I don't intend to export stuff because I get one list of all the files that got transferred. Now, that doesn't mean it's all I'm interested in, right? Sometimes the knowledge of a file itself, a file name itself can be really, really interesting. Um, but it, we're not gonna see that here because those objects don't get transferred across. Right, but okay. So, so again, I've got. Uh, oh, am I in the right? Is that gonna be file copy? I may be in the same. Did I? Did we look at this file already? Let's see. I feel like I may be in exactly the same file that I was. Oh yeah, that's the file that I was on before. Well, that's no fun, right? Let's go grab something. I was like, man, that looks suspiciously familiar. Indeed, it was. Right? Live demos for the win. SMB or SMB two. Okay. So, <clears throat> okay, so here we're seeing a, uh, a couple of NetBIOS announcements. If you're not familiar with uh, not familiar with these, those are typically on port 137 or 138. Um, but what I'm really interested in, again, here we see the connection. Let's see about exporting any, any super interesting in this. If your server service, IPC dollar sign, server service. Yeah, so this is where things get fun, right? This is where things get all kinds of fun. Um, why are we connecting to the C drive? All right, sorry, C drive, the C dollar sign. That's an administrative share, right? Now, and this is a spot where I definitely want to take a harder look. And this is where that export objects piece comes in super, 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 uh, super, super useful, right? Um, so here I see I see that we took a look for uh, creating a request file around desktop.ini. Well, that's interesting, all right? Um, so tell you what. Let's go ahead here. I'm going to mark this, uh, basically mark this packet. And if you're not familiar with marking, um, this is actually really, really useful. If you've never used this before, um, th this is a like life-changing in Wireshark uh, piece because I don't have to try to go back and find that stuff I was interested in um, before. Um, so it makes it, you know, again, I can highlight, and, and by the way, this gets saved with the PCAP, right? Um, so I can also, by the way, and this is, this is fantastic if you haven't seen this as well, um, you can actually come in and say, hey, go export uh, export packets. And you can say here as well, only export the marked packets, right? So if you wanna trim a packet capture down, this is a really, really easy way to do it. I've seen people in the past who are like, yeah, I, I, I had to write this crazy filter, right? So that it would only show the, I'm like, no, 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 you don't, right? Like, and you know, they're trying to like write a filter to include some stuff, but exclude lots of other stuff and the whole, it's madness, just mark packets and call it a day, right? Um, so anyway, so the reason I'm marking this is I'm going to come in here to the object export, right? Um, and export objects, SMB, because you'll notice over here I'm a packet 587, right? So anything before this, I I'm not really that interested in, but anything after this, I might be really interested in, right? Uh, because those likely came from the uh, the C dollar sign. And again, we can connect all those. Oh, in fact, 
we can, of course, because it's right here, um, versus the uh, basically versus you know connecting to uh, this doesn't look like we captured or it looks like there's a protocol decode error there. I think that was the share uh, share uh, piece there, but all that, that might be worth a worth a further look there. Um, so notice here as well, uh, we're able to tell whether it's a, a read or a read write operation, right? It's R and W. Um, but now again, I, I can take a hard look at again what did a threat actor copy, or again, assuming this is a threat actor, I think we can look here and say this doesn't look like a threat actor, right? Um, now, and I say it doesn't look like a threat actor because if it was a threat actor, I'd expect them to either upload something uh, to the system, right? Um, so basically to the system that they connected to on the C, you know, basically the, uh, the C drive, um, I'd expect them to upload something or download something, right? Now it's possible, and I wanna be like super pedantic here and say I can't rule out that it's a threat actor, but it is probable that it's not, right? It doesn't fit threat actor behavior, right? Um, so, also the fact that we only looked in the download folder, we didn't, uh, you know, didn't look at, yeah, we grabbed a desktop, but we didn't grab an actual, like, we didn't go look at the actual desktop, we didn't look at the My Documents, we did, there's so much stuff here that I expect for us, you know, expect to see a threat actor do that we just didn't, right? Um, now, I'm not going to walk through the exporting of these again, because, eh, whatever, um, I mean, we could, right? Matter, you know what, I take that back, I am actually going to do that take that back and I'll show you why here in a second. Um, this is the copy, uh, I'll select folder. Okay, and then I'm gonna open back up, oh, I don't need that, let's grab this. Uh, oh, I, that was in copy, bum, 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 there we go. Um, what I wanted to show you here, and this is safe to open, right, it is safe to open, but um, I did wanna show you here that indeed, you can go inspect these file contents, right? Um, now. I, I got I, I to gotta throw the legal disclaimer out here. Obviously, if you're investigating an intrusion, right, don't just go export objects and like open this on your production machine. That is a bad plan. In the realm of bad plans, that is a really bad plan. But this is a fantastic ability, right? Um, especially, again, I want you to put yourself back in the breach response side, right? Because I hate framing it like this, but that's a lot of what we use packet capture for. It's a lot of what I, now you can do lots of other operations stuff with it. I can't tell you how many operations issues I've troubleshot using packet capture, but in, in the context of breach response, right? Particularly if you're like, oh, well, what was in the file, right? You know, I've got it, I've got it right here, right? This has become exceptionally useful in a couple of cases where um, we had the threat actor generating data from recon, right? Effectively doing reconnaissance, writing out to a couple of text files and then copying those across to a staging system. Now, if you're not familiar with this behavior, very often threat actors will uh, basically uh, group data together in, on a given system. Um, they may have, you know, uh, they may have access to, you know, several systems in your environment or a hundred systems in your environment, but they try to limit the exfil coming from only a couple of those systems, right, is, is a very common paradigm. And so, you know, we, we had East-West packet capture, we're able to go in and see some of the reconnaissance they did. And, and honestly, it changed the, uh, that, that being able to read those text files, which again, they had shredded on secure deleted um, on the source system and, and even the destination system. We had them in packet capture. And so this changed our response. And I got to tell you that we were fighting and, and friends, if you do instant response, you probably fought this as well. We're fighting that uphill battle around the, are we changing the service account password, right? And, and of course, you know me, the answer was, of course you are. You have to change the service account password. And then we had a bunch of, we don't think the actual password itself was compromised and monitoring, dot, 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 dot. But one of those text files, right, on the recon side was them dumping creds with uh, our, our good friend Mimi Cats, right? So they were using, uh, I think, out of PowerSploit, if I recall correctly. Um, and so we were able to see the plain text password in that. We're like, listen, it's not up for debate anymore about how hard this is. It's not about a risk versus reward benefit. At this point, we are telling you the threat actor that has been inside your environment has a plain text password or service account um, that on many systems is, uh, you know, ultimately has administrative permissions, right? So it, it's it's not a question of, of, of how hard is this going to be. You're going to do it, right? I mean, I obviously don't like, you know, you're going to do it, but like, you have to do this. It's just not optional, right? So anyway, I was showing you that like as an example of it. Um, let's hop over here and we're going to take a look at a lateral movement case, right? Because this happens, right? Okay, so a couple of things. First off, I want to drop down here to SMB, SMB2. 
All the way down here, and I want to show something over here first. Is anybody familiar with Sysvol? If not, you should be, right? Sysvol is on every domain controller. It's a default file share on every domain controller. As you analyze SMB and packet capture, particularly in the context of incident response, it happens practically every time where I get a new analyst, and even some old analysts, right? Please don't think I'm picking on new analysts at all. I'm absolutely not. Um, it's just not knowledge that, that people you know, tend or necessarily have, right? Um, I, I'm an old school MCSE, right? Uh, I don't want to date myself, but, but MCSE from Windows 2000. Um, and uh, alas, uh, you know, I can tell you that Sysfall is on every domain controller. And it, the contents of Sysfall synchronize across all domain controllers in a given domain. So regardless of which DC you connect to, you're able to find the same data. It's where group policy is stored, and it's where your logon scripts are stored. And some organizations, although they should not do this, use it as a software distribution point because it's just it's an easy button. And there's lots of reasons not to do that, and that's beyond the scope of this webinar. But um, lots of folks will step back and they'll say, well, that dot 103, I think that one's compromised. We should be watching out for that one. Right? And then they're like, oh my gosh, hair on fire. Talk to the domain controller on port 445. The domain they have domain admin. First off, let me back up here. I'm not telling you they don't have domain admin. I don't know, right? What I do know is that regularly, every domain joined workstation and server in the network connects to SMB, connects to Sysfall specifically, right? That's it, done, there you go, right? So what do we see here? Sure enough, what do you know? They're grabbing a policy and in fact, with exporting the objects, you can actually look at the policies. You can just read the policies. How cool is that, right? Okay, um, so now I say how cool is that? It may make sense, it may not, whatever. Um, bottom line, we're not gonna deal with that here, but I did wanna show it here because I'll get stuck in the lateral movement stuff and we won't talk about this and I wanted to make sure I talked about this, All right? So let me scroll up here and we'll go back up to our lateral movement piece. So, um, you can see that there are some requests some responses. Now, again, you noticed over here, this, this is really where, where I start getting a little uh, unhappy, right? So now we've got, again, this BP win and C dollar sign and, oh man, um, threat actors use the default shares. They do. Um, and, and if somebody successfully connects here, I want to be very clear here that when they successfully connect, you know, you just already know that they have administrative permissions. That's it, right? Um, so then I see this create request file, um, users jane test input.dll. Okay, well that, that, that's not ideal, right? Um, we can infer at this point that we are, uh, that we are writing the, uh, I say infer, we'll ab absolutely get there, uh, but you can see here that we're transferring, uh, ultimately transferring this file, uh, user jane test input.dll, uh, right? Um, and then you can see here as well, um, that we have a request around basically the metadata for that file as well as uh, ultimately the response um, and so this is uh, again if, if we're looking for like okay uh, did, did something get transferred the answer is oh yeah without a doubt right okay well let's then go take a look at objects blah, smb right and again we, we can see here i'm not going to save all uh, yeah i'm not going to save all of these oh heck i'll save all of them so you can see um, this is our lateral oops Yes, what I meant to do was lateral. There we go. Okay, um, and so let's go open that up. Okay, um, so you'll notice here that this file ID, whatever, right, has the same size as input.dll, right? Um, that, that's because it is the same as, as input.dll. Um, now, this is our group policy, and if you're curious, like, what's in, what's in group policy, right? Uh, well, I'm going to go ahead and open this in uh, in Notepad, and you can see that there's well nothing. And because this is a test network, we don't have group policies set up. But if this were not a test network, you would have actual group policies here, and that's yeah. Um, okay, uh, so got that. Um, and oh, finally, I should mention here, by the way, that uh, let's go take a look at uh, input.dll and virus total. Virus total for the win. And it says, yeah, again, this is another Microsoft, uh, you know, file. Now, if you're like, hey, why didn't you guys do lots of cool metasploity stuff, whatever here, um, it, it came down to originally, uh, we had talked about distributing the packet capture. I rolled into here, sadly, without being 100% sure, and I should have validated that. Um, but that was actually a discussion point. If, if we create malicious DLLs here, 
um, that's going to create uh, antivirus pop-ups on as you go to exports. And I, I don't want that for you. I don't want that for me either. Um, and uh, yeah, all, all that, right? So if you're curious again, why are we using inert uh, data versus uh, malware? Um, that, that's that's the answer, right? Uh, but this is an example of you know a, again a pretty clear example of of, of lateral movement here. Um, oh, it's it's bang, binging at me because now. Obviously, just copying the DLL doesn't get you code execution, right? It gets you the payload, but it doesn't get you the actual execution itself. Um, so, anywho, um, wow, I think I'm right. Oh, you know what I wanted to do here? Uh, let's see, GitHub. Let's see, really? Is that where we're at here? No, I don't want images. I want it all. Is that that it? Okay, so uh, ridiculous. I was I I have one of these things about like using a uh, wow how about GitHub.com? This is always problematic here, right? Oh, malware Jake public. There we go. I was like, bah. Okay, so I'm gonna drop this into chat so that we've got this. This is where I'm gonna be uploading the. Uh, this is where I'll be uploading. Oh, that's the panelists only. Let's make that to everybody. This is where. There we go. That link in the chat. That's where I'm going to be uploading the packet captures um, at the basically at, at the end of this uh, at the end of the presentation um, in like three minutes here. I'll be uploading the packet captures so you have them available. Um, and so uh, you can see I don't do a lot of coding here. I have the Endace HTTP. That's another repository tied back to unsurprising the first one of these Endace let us do. Um, and uh, there's a bunch in there with uh, looking through and troubleshooting HTTP. Um, look, if I can close out here because I've only got a couple of minutes left. Um, and uh, if I can close out, I, I do want to, and I've got some like, you know, screenshotty stuff to make sure that I can go back and um, and play, but or go back if I have like demo fails or whatever. Um, but look, I, I do want to close out with a couple of a uh, couple of high points. First off, SMB analysis it's not commonly done during incident response, and and I I got to say that's because the data just usually isn't available. Um, if you don't have east-west traffic on on tap. Um, you know, at least some. You, I get it. You can't store months of east-west traffic. I, I get it. It's just too much, right? Well, in a lot of cases, it's too much. Um, you know, obviously risk-reward kind of stuff. But east-west traffic, it's pivotal to performing analysis. Um, and I, I just, again, you know, lots of folks are like, well, the average breach is detected 30 to 90 days in, and uh, we, we aren't storing 30 days, and certainly not 90, and 24 hours. Give me 24 hours, right? Like, you know, because the number of operational issues that you can that you can uncover with east-west uh, packet capture, absolutely amazing, right? To like, you know, in the middle of something and it's just just huge, right? Um, and then analysts, you have to decompose network IOCs and find index fields. I had that before. Um, I also mentioned here bringing the relevant data, the analyst and the familiar tool is going to help break down those traffic analysis barriers, right? And we actually have another webinar coming up in the series. I mentioned that there's a white paper coming out as well. Uh, we have another webinar in the series coming up where we are going to get into email, right? And, and very specifically, we're going to take a look at SMTP and IMAP. Um, now, I'm sure there's somebody who's like, what about POP3? And I, I would also say like, yeah, what about POP3, right? Um, I could also cover carrier pigeons, right? But no, I'm kidding. We, we might talk about POP3, but we're going to focus obviously on the cool stuff that, that, that we're dealing with every day, right? So IMAP and SMTP, uh, we'll walk through a bit there and do some more packet analysis. Um, I, I've, I've consumed, I think, like right up to the time. Uh, my apologies there, but if you have like some burning question you wanted to answer, but certainly reach out. Um, likewise, again, I'm going to be uploading these, uh, these packet captures so that you have them available um, and can actually go back and play with this data. Again, I can't thank Endace enough for this, um, you know, this opportunity actually to come in and um, We'll do this, right? We're just teaching. I mean, we're, we're here like jamming in the middle of, it's so rare that I get the opportunity to do this. So um, really appreciate the opportunity. Thanks, Endace. And thanks to every one of you uh, for attending today. Carol, I'm going to hand it back to you. All right. Thank you so much, Jake, for your great presentation and to Endace for sponsoring this webcast, which helps bring this content to the SANS community. To our audience, we greatly appreciate you listening in. For a schedule of all upcoming and archived SANS webcasts, including this one, please visit sans.org forward slash webcasts. Until next time, take care, and we hope to have you back again for the next SANS webcast.